thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope everyone is having a great week so far and has recovered from the Gonzaga run for our men and women's basketball program. We are excited to host this event after the final four, uh, as everyone has had time to recover and, and get back onto our academic schedule. Again, for those of you just joining us, welcome. We are excited for the evening. We've got about an hour and we will um, be uh, excited to welcome a, a very special guest and four deans. As I mentioned, my name is Jeff Gelby and I'm with University Advancement. Uh, to begin, I'd like to introduce four of our academic leaders at Gonzaga University, uh, very special leaders for us who um, uh, have made a tremendous impact in our uh, different colleges and units. To begin, uh, Dean Anne-Marie Cagno is our Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences in her first year, quite a first year, uh, Anne-Marie, to become a Dean. Uh, Anne-Marie comes to us from uh, Wayne State in Michigan and is a psychologist by trade. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Uh, from our dean, of the, our dean of the School of Education, Yoli Gallardo comes to us from Berea College in her second year. Yoli is an educator by trade and is a tremendous leader and doing great things with our School of Education. Uh, our School of Engineering and Applied Sciences welcomed Dean Carleen Hu two years ago. Uh, Carleen is a chemical engineer and came to us from, I believe, Montana State uh, at her most recent stop and is doing great things with the School of Engineering, as you all seen our new integrated sciences and engineering facility standing up very soon. And finally, last but not least, coming to us from the University of Utah in her second year is Dean Rosemary Hunter for our School of Leadership Studies. Rosemary is a social worker by trade and is a, one of the nicest human beings you will meet doing great things with the School of Leadership Studies. So a couple things as we get going, I'll introduce our speaker, just a little bit of logistics. Um, as uh, the speaker is talking or the deans, you're welcome to ask questions to the deans and to Ryan. Please put them in the chat and include if you would, especially if you're a student, what your discipline or your area of study is. If you're an alum or external, you're also welcome to mention your class year or what also your career and or area study was as well. We will try to get to as many as we can. And if we cannot get to them, we will try to do our best to respond in written format. So without further ado, I want to introduce a very special friend of mine coming back, uh, going back a long way from Catherine, Wyoming. We grew up together, went to college together, but most importantly, have followed her career over the years. And this is Ryan Prouty. Ryan is the Assistant Director for Vision and Strategy at the NASA Johnson Space Center. She leads strategy, planning, execution of Johnson Space Center, uh, DARE, Unite, Explore Vision, driving initiatives and activities centered on the exciting and ever-involving future of human space flight in the space city. Crowdy started her NASA career in mission control as a communications and tra tracking officer, flight controller, and spent the next 23 years working in the International Space Station. She's initiated and led a paradigm shift for the people in the space station program from values and norms required for building a space vehicle to values and norms required to enable science discovery and viable commerce in low earth orbit. An effort to completely re-engineer the ISS program in order for it to better meet its vision of enabling science discovery and fostering commercial enterprise in space. The initiative revolutionized ISS for science and exploration was a monumental culture change initiative, the likes of which rarely, if ever, occur in a government agency, as many of us know. She has been awarded the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, as well as two exceptional achievement medals, two highly regarded awards in the agency. In addition to a silver Snoopy and two spaceflight achievements, and her most recent award, ISS honored her with the Spaceflight Awareness Management Award, which recognizes leaders who demonstrate loyalty, empowerment, accountability, diversity, excellence, respect, sharing, honesty, integrity, and proactiveness. Ryan, you almost sound like a Zach. <laughs> Holds a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from the University of Wyoming. Again, a very special friend. We're excited to listen, Ryan, as you talk us and walk us through your career in leadership, and we're excited to interact with the Dean. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you. That was very kind. I'm really glad you didn't say how many years we've known each other. That may have tanked me from the beginning, but you were also very nice to say the technical difficulties were um, just technical difficulties and not mine. So there's everybody's introduction. NASA does everything perfectly the first time and nothing ever breaks. <laughs> so there you go. 
Um, today, I'm going to tell a few more stories, like Jeff said, about, about my career, um, opportunities I've had, and a little bit about lessons I learned along the way to give, you know, kind of an idea of what I've learned about leadership and what it's been like um, for me in my journey. So with that, we'll get started. So this, I love this picture. Jeff might recognize this picture, but this is a picture of my prospects after I graduated from the University of Wyoming in mathematics in 1997. I, I kind of played the game. I loved math. I was good at it. In the late 90s, as a female in STEM, I really knew that I could go work anywhere. My biggest problem was I had no idea what I wanted to do. Did I want to be an engineer? Did I want to be an actuarialist? I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what, um, I just didn't know where I was headed, but I knew I could get a job. My grand plan was to go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming and become a ski bum, which I did. And my dad always teased me that I wouldn't, well, how did he say it? I wouldn't make it through the first season. And truth be told, I didn't even make it to winter. You can go to the next slide, Whitney. Um, the first lesson I learned on my journey was inspiration will strike in the strangest of places, but I'm sitting there in Jackson Hole. It's about June, July now. I've been graduated for a couple months, still don't have a lot of prospects, although I'm managing a Chico's, which didn't serve me very well. Um, and I was in this hair salon waiting for my appointment. And I look over and sitting on the table next to me was this magazine, a Time Magazine, Newsweek. I don't know what it was, but there's this picture on it that you see in front of you of this old decrepit satellite or space vehicle or whatever. I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen it before. And so I open it up. I'm interested. And I start reading this article and it was like out of Hollywood. It was this story of three, cos well, two cosmonauts and one astronaut who were on board the Mir, Russian Mir space station. And their cargo vehicle had just launched and taking supplies, you know, food, water, hardware, whatever they needed, had lost its guidance system within the proximity of the station and crashed into one of the modules in their space station. Crew went into rapid depress. That is one of the three most um, horrible failures. It's a very bad day, as we call it at NASA. And it's this, the article goes on to talk about this crew closing the hatches, saving the station, saving the day. And I was floored. I'm thinking, what am I doing here? How in the world do I not know this is going on? This sounds really amazing. And the very last paragraph of this article, I'll never forget it, said, essentially, probably not in these words, oh, by the way, Houston is building an international space station with the Russians. We're hiring. I'm like, that's it. That's it. I want to go to Moscow. I want to live in Russia. I'm in. And so I bar I literally borrowed a typewriter because I didn't own a computer and sent my resume to Houston. I applied for a couple contractor companies and got picked up. So with my sole possession, my little chocolate dog there in the middle and moved to the big city. One of, well, Texas anyway, was one of the two places I swore I would never live. And now I've been here longer than I lived in Wyoming, which is kind of sad. Didn't want to have to admit that to Jeff, but that's the truth. So next slide. How it all started. Um, one of my favorite stories for Space Station was I, I did get to Texas and I did get to go live in Russia. Um, December 13th, 1998, I am standing in this newly refurbished, actually newly built, looks like plastic Ikea came out of the box control center in the bowels of the Russian Mission Control Center Moscow. When you walk in the doors of MCCM is what we call it, it feels like you're walking into this ancient, storied, beautiful cathedral from another world. All of the walls are real wood lined panels. There's these huge stained glass windows, really dim lighting, honestly, because they couldn't pay for lighting in the late 90s. So all the lights stayed off, which also means the heat stayed off. <laughs> that was not fun because um, I was there through the winter. 
But on this day, December 13th, there were about five to 10 Americans in our little control room because the Russians wouldn't let us into theirs. We had to stay in ours and we're circled around this tiny little TV waiting for the video of the very first picture of the International Space Station. And that's what you see on your left. And we heard the call, Houston, we have a space station. And you could hear the whole building just exploded in cheers and tears and laughter and crying because people have been working on this literally for decades. And we finally got to the point in December, 1998, where the first US module and the first Russian module were joined in space by Space Shuttle Discovery and the commander called down that they had a space station when the shuttle backed away and sent us this picture. And I will never, ever, ever forget that moment and being in that room and, oh my gosh, the spread after and the party after. Granted, I was just out of college. It was still a party. <laughs> and now I've traveled a lot of places and it was still a giant spread, but it was an experience that I'll never, ever forget. So 22 years later, that picture on the right is where we are today. And I'll tell some stories along the way about what I got to do, but it, okay. Um, it blows my mind today that for my kids age 15 and 17, they have never known a day without Americans living in space. And so for those of us who grew up most of our lives getting to watch the space shuttles go and it was really exciting, but now 20 plus consecutive years of always having someone in space. It just, it just kind of blows my mind. So we call that our 20th birthday pick. But the crew you see in front of you, that's who's on board right now. Typically we have uh, five to seven people, but right now we have 10. So it's kind of a fun week to do this talk because it's pretty, pretty full up there. We had um, one American and two Russians launched last October, three Americans and one Japanese launch in November and then two more Russians and American launch just last Saturday. Um, the Russian flights, we've been doing that for 20 plus years, not that big a deal, but the launch in November was a very, very big deal. That was the first full crewed flight of the SpaceX Dragon vehicle. And so we launched um, Shannon, Mike, Vic, and Suichi up in November, and they'll be coming home They'll be coming home soon. Kate and two Russian Sergeys will be coming home Saturday, and then we'll launch another SpaceX vehicle here in the near future. So it's pretty pretty full up there, pretty exciting. They have a, they have a lot to do. The space station itself has had 232 successful launches um, to the ISS, seven different launch vehicles, four different countries. I think we're up to 245 different people have lived and worked on board the ISS. The ISS in and of itself, you can see this picture, it's actually very representative, is only about three feet short of an entire football field, including end zones, weighs about 900,000 pounds. The whole internal uh, livable space is about the size of a five to six bedroom house. It's, it's quite big, um, quite, new, quite, I'll say roomy, although we do have a lot of st stuff up there to keep a space vehicle flying and feed 10 people at a time. But the ISS is about 250 miles up off the surface of the Earth, flies 17,500 miles an hour, which is about five miles a second. 52 flight computers, eight miles of wire, 1. million lines of source code. It is truly um, one of the greatest technological endeavors of its time. We, the crew, we, although I have tried it, the crew consumes water that's about 90% recycled from their own waste as well as water that we collect from the atmosphere. On the next page, you can see that these are our major partners and all of the pieces that they put into the space station. In the blue, you see all of the US, the US pieces, purple, you see Japanese, green, European, yellow, Canadian, and red are all the Russian pieces. Um, mostly US, obviously the solar rays, cover about an acre of space, but that um, looks like the most, the most, I'll say land area <laughs> in this picture. But the most, I love showing this picture because the crazy thing to me is all of these pieces, and we assembled the space station over 
about 14 years total, a little less than that, none of these pieces went together on the ground before they flew in space. And every single piece we flew went together almost without a hitch. We had a, we had a couple hitches, but we figured it out. So why do we do it? Why do we fly the space station? And the answer is we fly to steward discovery, foster commerce, and enable exploration. You know, when we very first started building the space station, Clinton was the one who partnered us. We were doing it just um, by ourselves. Um, we called it Space Station Freedom and it was just American, but we realized quite quickly that what we were trying to pursue, we wouldn't be able to do with the budget we were given. So Clinton gave us the Russians. Um, of course, NASA, we like to think that we're not political, but um, we always have political motivations for our big changes in vision through the years. And um, Clinton really wanted to build a better partnership with the Russians. And to be quite frank, the Russians knew about long duration space flight. They knew ways to live in long duration space flight that we didn't know yet. Um, and so we got we got partnered with them. And at first it was just to build it. Let's work internationally. Let's build these collaborations. I think one of the legacies of Space Station will be the international collaborations that we have held onto and built throughout the years that are now a model for the rest of our government. Um, but once it was built, we needed to use it. We needed our return on investment. And so I'm convinced that the, the data and science samples that we are returning from the ISS will forever change human life. And it may be years or decades before we truly know what the value of what we've done on ISS provides us. We utilize a whole swath of disciplines on the space station from biological to physical materials, combustion, you name it, we're working on it. Aside from science, commercialization is a big new topic for us these days. While we garner unfettered bipartisan support in Congress, we really don't have the budget to do our exploration missions. And if you look around at the massive growth of commercial aerospace, one of the things that has been really interesting to be a part of is how do we build those new partnerships and what does that look like coming from inside the government and doing things like human spaceflight that really nobody else besides other actual countries have done before. And now we're partnering with commercial companies to do it. Up until last year, we hadn't launched Americans from U.S. soil to space since shuttle retired in 2011. And so it's been a really long time since we've had that capability. And now we use commercial companies to do science experiments on the space station, to run facilities on the space station for us to do our science. We use commercial companies to launch all of our cargo. Now we're going to use them to launch our crew. And there's a, an economic model that now NASA is a forerunner in the forefront of trying to develop um, for the country as a whole. And lastly, of course, trying to complete our exploration missions and the research and technology that we're utilizing and learning on the space station um, we need in order to go for, for farther, in order to get to Moon and Mars. You can see on the chart that Whitney has up, um, we've done investigations from 108 countries. Over 3,000 science experiments have been conducted on the space station. and um, we have papers totaling over a thousand different research papers have already been published with um, findings from International Space Station research thus far. But so that's a little bit kind of a mouthful about space station in general. You can tell I get really excited and passionate about talking about it, but I'll tell you a little bit more about my journey now. Let me get a sip real quick. Working on an international program has meant getting to indulge a bit in another one of my favorite passions, and that's traveling. I've gotten to spend New Year's in Red Square, watched rocket launches from multiple countries, stopped waiting for camels to get out of the road uh, in Kazakhstan, shared pretzels in Germany, and worked with my international partners on the strategy for what we're going, how we're going to utilize the space station um, from Japan and from uh, 
Amsterdam from the Netherlands. But I'd like to share a little bit more about my journey and lessons that I learned along the way through different opportunities I had to stretch myself and, and grow in my career. I can, and sorry, Whitney, these are animated. So if you could click just one more time, perfect. And we'll wait for the next one. But I consider myself a lifelong learner. Um, I actually always thought that I would end up being a professor, um, but I kind of feel like one anyway, because I'm always, I'm always learning. I'm always teaching. Um, there's, I've always got some version of self-help or leadership book, um, usually multiple open on, open on my nightstand. But I find that most of the lessons I've learned have been at critical moments uh, throughout my career. And here's a few of them for you, for you. My first one is be willing. I remember I had this teacher in second grade. Her name was um, Mrs. Smith, and she put together this math mountain. And the idea was there are these little people that we climb up the mountain. And if the first one to the top won a prize or whatever else. And in her entire career of teaching, she'd never had a girl try to race to the top of the mountain. And so, you know, I was always um, at that age anyway the shy one. I didn't want to raise my hand in class. I may know the answers, but you know, as long as class was moving, I was fine, but you put a competition on it and, and I was in. And so I was all in on that math mountain. So I could, so I could win and I did, but what it taught me was to be willing to jump in that fray. My very first job that I moved to a place I didn't know anybody in Texas was to be willing to do something I'd never done before. Um, within a year of moving to Houston, I found myself um, on console. You can see me sitting there with a lot darker and a lot longer hair for the first element launch of the space station. I had to learn Russian. I had to figure out how to translate what the Russians were doing with their communication station. So communication systems. So I could tell the flight director what was happening on a vehicle that I didn't know, I didn't design, I didn't build. Um, that was a little stressful. I A month later was when I moved to Moscow and got to be there for um, the mating of the first two pieces of the space station. But a few months after returning from Moscow, I got fully certified to be a front room flight controller. So sitting there with my headset on, commanding um, the space station, all the communication systems to the space station. So all of the other people in the control center could see their data and understand what was happening with their systems. I didn't realize at the time exactly how quickly I moved, but when I got back from Moscow, we were short staffed. We were doing 24 hour ops, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we didn't have enough controllers. We didn't have enough certified controllers to do that. So they asked me, they said, Ryan, you've been to Moscow, you've learned their systems. Will you skip the back room, which is like the support room to the front front room flight controllers and just go to the front room? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. So I buckled down, I studied hard, I did it. I didn't know it. I didn't realize until years later that I actually had become the first female um, communications officer for space station. It didn't even dawn on me. I was just like, yes, let's go. Let's go do this. Let's sit in the front room. Let's fly the space station. So I had to be willing. The lesson to me was be willing to jump in, to be in the fray, to do something hard, to do something scary, to learn, to learn something new that I had never done before. And it, and it paid off. I got to have this amazing moment in 1999. I was sitting in the control center and it was just a normal, normal shift for the day. And the, where my console was situated, I was right across the aisle from the flight director. Her name was Sally Davis. Um, she was a wonderfully competent flight director, a great mentor for me. But I see her stand up and, I, and I'm watching her look around the room and she gets on the, on the mic and she says, I'd like everybody to meet me on the airways. And what that means is we're not going to touch our buttons. We're not talking on the loops, but she wanted everybody to stand up and just talk to each other in the room. And so we all stand up and we're like, what's going on? And she gets off um, her loops and she said, I want all of you to look around the room and tell me what you notice. And Sally's about, about 15, 20, maybe probably not quite that much older than me. And I look around the room and I just see my coworkers and I don't think anything of it. And 
she proceeds to point out that every single person sitting in that flight control room was female. And it was the first time in history that that had ever happened. 1999 for the International Space Station. And I will, we don't have any pictures, right? It wasn't the time when we were, you know, nothing was breaking. So there weren't any tragedies going on. Um, but it was a moment I'll never forget to be in that room with, with my coworkers and other, and other women getting to fly, getting to fly the space station. That was pretty cool. My next lesson was learning how to be creative. And there's actually someone on the call who went to Gonzaga that I've worked with in the past and he'll, he'll like this story probably. But um, after I left operations, I was there for about four or five years I went to the space station program and one of the jobs that I did in the space station program was to work in the mission evaluation room. And fun fact, today is the anniversary of the explosion on the Apollo 13 aircraft that caused that mission to be shortened and not get to land on the moon. Um, I learned that taking my son to school today, but the MER, as we call it, is the room where all of the engineers who designed, built, tested, every single component of that space station work. And the people you actually see on TV are allowed to operate the space station when it's working perfectly. The people you don't see on TV are the ones they call when you have a problem. And so in these particular, particular pictures that I pulled out, what you can see in the top picture, that's Scott Parazinski, and that moment in that picture, he's farther away from what we call the airlock. Think of it like your porch. Um, farther away from the door to the space station than any astronaut has ever been before then or since, because while we were deploying a solar array that we had folded up and then went back to deploy because we had to move it somewhere else on the space station, tore a gigantic gaping hole in this thing. This was about 2008, yeah, 13 years ago. At that moment, you could have heard a pin drop. In that moment, as we watch, it's like a zipper, you know, when you rip a zipper on your jacket or on a tent and it no longer goes together, that. We didn't know in that moment if we were completely done building space station. We also didn't know in that moment, because at that point we had no structural integrity for that solar array, if we would be able to undock the shuttle with its seven astronauts safely without tearing off the solar array and consequently hitting the space shuttle to get our astronauts home. So lots of meetings, lots of work, lots of, I won't say panic, we actually don't, it's, it's crazy, this, this kind of stuff happens and you actually have no idea how you're going to fix it in that moment. People don't panic, it's, it's the most amazing culture. But you know, we fixed this solar array with a cufflink. I have this, um, really good friend who used to work in structures and he figured out how to take apart a three ring binder, wrap all the metal parts and grounding bolts and wires together to literally make a cuff link to span five of them across our broken solar array. So we could tension it down so we could continue on the mission and it worked. I learned working in the mission control room just how creative engineers can be. You know, we always make fun of engineers for being too strict and too regimented. And it, I designed it this way and it must work this way. We have fixed the space station with cufflinks. We have protected valves with tuna cans from the crew's lunch. We have um, used loose leaf tea out of tea bags that we cut open to find holes holes in cracks in the hole of the space station. Creativity will get people a long, long way. And I learned um, through working with these engineers to never give up on your creativity. Find those ideas that are way outside the box and, and put them to good use because you never know what you're going to fix tomorrow. Another lesson I learned along the way was to be prepared. Back when I was working in the more back when the space shuttle was flying, and I was the lead of the MER, I had the, <laughs> I'll say illustrious, but not really, job of getting to work every morning about 3 or 4 a.m. and getting up to speed on literally every single thing that happened in the last 24 hours. Because I would walk into a meeting at 5 a.m. to brief the space station program manager 
everything that he needed to know, everything that worked, everything that didn't work, everything we needed to change, everything we were doing that day, the next day, what he needed to talk to his international partners about. So he could go into a meeting with the Japanese and then the Europeans and then the Russians and then bring everybody together at our big mission management team. So we could vote and we could make decisions and give direction for what we were going to do that day and how we were going to fix whatever's broken because <laughs> like Jeff talked about technical difficulties at the beginning, every single day the space shuttle was docked to the space station, something happened. Something happened and we had to figure it out. I could get a question at any time along the way and I had to be resourceful to understand what was happening in the bigger context so I could be prepared um, to answer any to answer any questions because we didn't have time to not have answers for the questions. I would not recommend working in this manner for a very long time. I actually it was quite it could be quite challenging to be plugged in and you know I'd have five different things up on my laptop so I could touch any one person to answer any specific question at any time. But it was an amazing time to learn how to be prepared for different for different scenarios. Um, I got to watch this team through onboarding of the international partners, retirement of the space shuttle, our first major contingency failure, which by the way, wasn't even the solar array. We had others later that were even worse, but, but that's a story for another time. Um, be, pre be prepared for anything. One of the things that I like to tell people, or I should say that I learned is not only being prepared by having the confidence that I know the answer. But one of the things I look for in people who work for me is when people don't know the answer and they tell me they don't know the answer. I like, I like to hear people say, you know, that's a good question. Let me go find out. It builds, it builds trust with me, but understanding when you don't know the answer can be just as valuable and just as important as, as when you do know it. The last lesson I learned um, is to be flexible. I, the hardest job, I've been in a lot of board meetings and technical discussions about some highly, and, ha and having to make some highly critical de decisions during my career in space station. But the single most difficult job I have ever done is what Jeff talked about in the beginning when I ran the culture shift, the paradigm shift for the space station, revolutionize ISS for science and exploration. Trying to change the hearts and minds of people from understanding their purpose and their way of life and their whole reason for being needs to shift. When they love what they do, that's hard. That's really, really hard. Um, trying to get people to understand that the whole premise of space station needed to change from one of assembly mode and building the space station to one of science discovery mode, where as the government, we were no longer the customer for products that contractors were providing us, but we were the customer service agent to help scientists commercial companies learn how to utilize the space station so we could build our return on investment. This was our black swan moment. You know, you hear about those with the blockbusters and the Kodaks of the world not being able to shift their reason for being, to shift their just cause. We had to do that. We had a program manager at the time who knew that if we didn't make those changes, we weren't going to survive it. We were going up against the failure is not an option culture for space station. Um, and we did it. We learned a lot. We were successful in a lot of areas. Um, but we also learned a lot of lessons about how to manage change, how to work through it, how to um, get people to refocus and understand the crux of where you need to make that change and how people show up and what they do every day. But being flexible was absolutely key because we at NASA, we like to do things the right way. And typically we like to do it only once because anything else is inefficient. Why would you do anything that's inefficient, right? But 
being willing to try something, seeing if it doesn't work and trying it again helped us move through this change in a manner that I think in the end made us successful. Jeff also talked about um, what I'm doing now. Um, and so I'll just introduce it a little bit. But after I did that work um, in the space station program, the JSC center director called me and asked me to come do that similar work for him at the Johnson Space Center level. And so how do we take where we are today, incredibly successful, arguably successful based on our past successes and figure out how to craft that vision of where we are headed as a human spaceflight center into the future. How do we learn to dare unite and explore where we're going to be 10, 15, 20 years from now? And what does that look like for us? And so um, not easy, not easy, especially in the world um, of a pandemic. I took my job about two weeks before we all got sent home. And so it's been super fun, but it's, amazing to watch this um, transformation of people's minds as they start to get outside their box and think about the world differently and understand um, the freedom that exists in getting to craft the world around you instead of having to respond to changes that come down on you. I have found, you know, there's that old quote, uh, people hate change, nobody likes change. I actually don't believe it. I believe that people thrive on change. People change all the time. They change their jobs, their hair, their car, their friends. It's when people try to change you, when someone tries to change me or make me change. Yeah, that I don't like. But if I can be in charge of my change, I'm all over it. And so I like to figure out how, how to motivate people, inspire people to be in charge of their own change. And then I wanted to show one last picture of where, where NASA is heading next. Um, it's typically a question I get when I get to go talk to people, but um, in the next decade, we planning to go back to the moon, learn what we can learn about uh, building habitation on the moon. Hopefully by the end of this year, launching the largest rocket, lar lar largest launch vehicle ever built. Um, by NASA with the Orion vehicle strapped on top um, in Artemis 1 later this year and on through the 20s and 30s headed, headed to Mars. And with that, I will pause to see if there are what questions everybody has. And I will say, um, Whitney, if I don't know if you're going to take the charts down, but the very last chart has resources. I didn't talk a lot about um, the science we have on space station or, or where you can find this stuff. There are apps out there that you can go find when space stations flying over your town, you can go. I actually, the program manager used to crack me up. Um, every time he'd get a question about a pre press conference or whatever else, he actually, we use this app. Like I work, <laughs> I work space station for 20 years and I use this app to figure out what science we're doing. Cause there's just so much I can't keep track. Thanks, Ryan. We've got several questions coming in. Um, do any of the deans have any questions you might like to field? I can ask one. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about, sorry about that, Rosie. That's all right. I'll get the next one. Just it's the teacher in me jumping out. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I couldn't I couldn't help but be thinking the entire time, Ryan, about your experiences from the time that you were a little girl in school. Uh, invariably, whenever you hear someone who is amazing, like you, I'll just put that out there right now. Um, whenever they're telling their story, they'll, they'll mention a teacher hmm. in their experience. Uh, and you did uh -huh. just that. Yeah. And so I was thinking about the opportunity that you felt even in just a small moment that your teacher may have given you to be limitless. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you had an audience of teachers in front of you right now in this moment, what would you tell them? How, what would you advise them in terms of providing those moments 
for the young girls in their in their classes with regard to you know uh, it, it doesn't take much to allow a child to dream and to realize that they can be limitless. What would you say to them? Yeah. Um, I work, I actually work with young girls quite a bit. I'm a scout master for my daughter's troop. And so it's, it's kind of similar principles, right? I'm not, I'm not teaching academics, but I'm teaching life to these girls. And a lot of what I find they need is just that core of belief, right? They need to know that what they want to do is exactly what they should follow. They and, and, and asking them questions around what they really feel passionate about or what gets them excited. I knew in second grade, climbing that math mountain, I was like, oh, math is fun. I can do this. And it was my favorite subject from then on. I had no idea what I wanted to do as a career, but I knew that was fun. And, and so I always encourage any students, um, but especially my scouts, my daughter, even she's headed to college next year. And she kept telling these college counselors, she wanted to be a business major. I'm like, you don't want to be a business major. Have you heard how you actually say it? I'm looking at business. I'm like, yeah, that's not what you want to do. What are you excited about? You love the outdoors, child. You, you would camp every day if I let you. Have you ever thought about environmental science? <gasps> that's a thing. Like I can go save the planet. I'm like, yes. Right. And so just touching what inspires them and feeding that for them, that makes it limitless for them. Rosie, you had a question. Yeah, I actually wanted to share one that's that's in the chat because this is one that I think that comes to, to me a lot in different ways from students. Um, but um, the, it's from Preston and Preston says, for students who dream of working at a company such as NASA, what are some of the best ways to stand out as a, a candidate? Um, mm -hmm. And he's given some examples, like should it be projects? Is it about GPA? Is it about extracurricular? Like what are those things that are gonna really help someone to be able to go into those kinds of um, organizations and what their dream jobs are? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of people expect me to say, you know, stay in, stay in STEM, do the do the technical. But I work with business majors and artists and communications majors and lawyers, um, and then of course the whole the whole gamut of technical. But I like to tell students, especially if you do if you are interested in STEM, definitely find what you like, study that, find a way to balance it. One of the best courses that I took at the University of Wyoming was a scientific, scientific and technical writing course. And that has served to have me be the official proofreader of almost every single set of charts or document that comes out of my, comes out of my office because I rounded myself out. I, I ended up with kind of a liberal arts degree. And so study what you love, but don't pigeonhole yourself. Find those other pieces. And then yes, e extracurriculars are, are always great. Um, I'm a little bit on the side of, I don't want to see a candidate come forward that's done all these things just to pad a resume. I want to see the candidate come forward that who did things they were passionate about for a higher purpose and being able to um, talk about that or communicate that in a way that comes through in your interview or comes through in your application. So, you know, it's not, I was in all of these honor societies and I did all this government work and I did band and football and whatever, it doesn't matter. Why, why did you do it? And, and what did you learn from it? That's that's what I wanna hear from people. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. As a reminder, we'll probably go an extra 10 minutes or so since we got started a few minutes late. So please do feel free to put your questions in. Uh, I do see another one talking about what are the benefits of going to Mars? Yeah, I liked that one. I used to get asked that one all the time for space station as well. And 
And Mars is a little different for me right now because it's, you know, there's this, when I talk about human spaceflight, one of the things I'm doing in my job right now is helping define for Johnson Space Center, why do we do human spaceflight? And it's very similar to the question about why do we go to Mars? And part of it is as humans, just how we're built, we are fueled with this pioneering spirit to go discover what we don't know. Why did we sail across the ocean? We didn't know what was out there, right? We don't really know everything that we're going to find on Mars. And so part of that is fueling that spirit within us to go learn what we don't know. Um, that was part of how we started building the space station. Well, we don't know, if, we don't know, really know if we can do this. We really don't know if this is gonna work. Let's go see if it does. Now that it has, we have a whole different purpose. I always tell the people who worked for me in space station, go find what you connect with. And one of the ones I always bring up and try not to make Jeff and I cry, but one of our best friends' daughters has cystic fibrosis and Prognosis is better these days than it used to be, but we have experiments on the space station that are studying how to cure cystic fibrosis. It doesn't have a cure right now. That gets me out of bed every morning. And so I think the why we're going to Mars, one is we don't know if we can, let's go see if we can. And then the evolution from there will come to us when we figure out what's there. I see an, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Um, thank you, Ryan, for an inspiring talk. It was just wonderful to have you with us tonight. Um, we do have a question in the chat from an alumni, an alum who asks about um, obstacles for women in STEM and women um, who want to um, break into NASA or any of these contracting companies who are doing the scientific studies. Um, from your vantage point, what do you see as the obstacles for women in STEM who want to enter these fields and how might we overcome them or address them? Oh, I wish I had a whole other hour. This might be, this might be my favorite topic. So maybe we should do a follow on, but, um, let's see where I want to start. I think it's, I think it's multifaceted. And here's what I mean by that. I think there still exists the traditional obstacles that people typically think of well, where you will butt up against um, this stigma or this culture of it's still male dominated. And, and I don't really know why, why you're here. Why are you coming to take our jobs? But to be fair, a lot of that I don't, I've seen a little bit of it, but it's not overt. It's more an unconscious bias, right? One of the biggest obstacles that I think women face in the field is an unconscious bias until there are women in hiring level positions who can round out the diversity of panelists who interview candidates um, it's harder to see what you've never seen. It's harder to um, go somewhere if you've never if you've never been there and and put it into practice. And I think another obstacle for us, and this is this is just my opinion. It's not NASA's. Um, it's us. I never assumed I had any obstacles, and I didn't face many. Um, I was asked to make coffee once. I politely declined um, <laughs> and a couple other instances. But I think sometimes we as women still carry with us this torch of it's going to be hard for me. It's not always. Sometimes it's just a matter of, of showing up. Hey Ryan, let me follow on with another question from the panelists that's related to that. They ask, could you talk about diversity, inclusion, equity, reaching out to students? How do we reach marginalized students? 
Yes, we, so this has been a big topic with us um, at Johnson Space Center for actually for years. Johnson's been really a front runner for the agency as a whole across the 10 centers, trying to figure out how to do that. Um, we're doing it in a number of ways. Um, one, I, I just talked about, right, in our hiring practices, and maybe it's the same in your um, accept acceptance practices um, coming into the university, we're diversifying our panels. Every single interview panel, um, we have requirements to fill with diverse um, diversity, not only to gender, but to race, but also across directorates. So we could be interviewing for a safety safety emission assurance position, but we'll bring someone in from engineering or we'll bring someone in from the operations world or, you know, something like that that comes from a different discipline. Um, maybe you could apply that in how you look at applications. We specifically, for example, I set up coalition teams in my current role for Johnson Space Center to look at different areas that the center director wanted us to go focus on. I built those teams, handpicked people based on a list. I pulled, I pulled from HR. I said, give me a diverse list. Give me the attributes. So I could pull and build a team that was diverse from the beginning. Um, I think as, as teachers, you can draw people out in a classroom fairly easily. It's harder when you're looking right across the whole campus and just going to tap on people to pull them in. Um, or know when they want to be pulled in. It's 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 a tough problem to solve, to be to be honest. But it it's one that I think um, I think it'll define this generation. I think from a NASA perspective, we're specifically reaching out to universities we've never reached out to before, because um, it's so easy. It's that that unconscious bias bites us all the time. We continue to go to the Texas A&M and the University of Texas and Purdue and Notre Dame and all of these, you know, Georgia Tech, all these big engineering schools. Nobody came to tap on my shoulder from the University of Wyoming. Why not? There's actually quite a few of us here. <laughs> and so how do we how do we reach back and go pull people from where we've been? Thank you for that. Yeah. Brian, there's a, a question here from Joy about when you were talking about your um, team, you mentioned that your team did not panic despite the crisis with the solar array. What, what mm -hmm. characteristics about your team do you think allowed them to remain calm and problem solve in that moment? I'll give you a funny answer and then I'll give you the real answer. <laughs> the funny answer is they're engineers and they have no emotion. So there's nothing to panic about. <laughs> The real answer is they're trained. They're like EMTs driving their ambulance to a car wreck on the street. They're trained to understand what's going on with this data and how to think about their system. They're very systematic. And so if you think about an, an um, ER physician or an emergency surgeon going in and they've done thousands of hours of practice, that's what these guys have done. These engineers and these operators, especially the operators who sit in the front room to respond to an emergency, the crew that closed the hatch, they've done that hundreds and hundreds of times. And so it's this, this ability to just, oh, that happened. This is what I'm supposed to go do. And we have rules, procedures. We have written down step by step by step by step. This is what we need to go do. Because in that moment, if you don't have it written down and you haven't practiced it, yeah, you'll panic at least a little bit on the inside, even if you're an engineer. <laughs> and I only say that because I behave like one. <laughs> Ryan, another question came in that's asked, what kind of metrics do you use to measure success? Mm. Gosh. I would, I would, I would ask back. It depends on what what success you're you're talking about, right? Um, did I inspire someone today to continue majoring in STEM? 
did we, um, we've already found a cure for one form of muscular dystrophy. I would consider that success. Um, we've maintained all of our partnerships with the international partners. I don't know, you know, those kind of things you can talk about. But when I, when I think about how to measure success for some of the change efforts that I've worked on before, um, we get really detailed down into the metrics of, okay, for example, when we only had three crew members on the space station, we could do about 30 hours of science a week. When we went up to four crew members on the space station, our goal was 60. So I can measure that. I can count how many hours of science I did with three people and I can count how many hours of science I did with four people. And so it's really understanding where are you headed and um, what do you wanna see when you get to that finish line. Brian, we have a question from a current freshman whose dream it is to work for places like NASA. Um, what are some good ways in your opinion that, um, that Sean could jumpstart himself into working in space exploration? What advice would you give? Internships. As a freshman, that is exactly where you wanna start is go find, um, go find a field or a project that interests you. And I would start applying to internships at any number of the aerospace companies that you that you can get to somewhere you can live. Um, even at NASA, I know NASA puts out calls for interns as well. And you can do those over um, school semesters or even over the summer. That's what I would, I never, I never did that. It never dawned on me to do that. Um, I actually started out as a contractor and worked for a contractor for, the first four or five years I was down here before I got picked up by NASA. But I wish, I wish I'd had that experience because um, I just fell into the honest, literally the first person who offered me a job. And that's, and that's where I stayed. It worked out. It's, it's great. It worked out, but I wish I'd had more, um, a little more experience coming in. And I see someone commented, yes, it's called pathways. And so you can, you can actually Google that NASA pathways and find NASA internships. But don't just stop at NASA. You can do internships um, for multiple companies, aerospace companies. Brian, you, you had mentioned um, just now and also earlier the role of serendipity and, and being open. And mm -hmm. being a Jesuit Catholic institution, um, sometimes we call it serendipity. Sometimes we call it the spirit. Um, yeah. So what would your advice be for people of any career stage, could be people who are in college, people after college, how, how do you cultivate that openness to being open to serendipity or the spirit or whatever our audience might call it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when you feel uncomfortable and you feel that knot right in the center of your core, it's telling you something. The trick is trying to figure out if it's telling you that's what you should go do or that's what you should not go do, right? I always, um, and, and it feels a little different and, and you'll know, but I got, um, I always tell people that I mentor, it's good to know what opportunities to turn down. Just, it's just as important to know what opportunities it is to turn down as it is what opportunities to pursue. And I always go back to, does that Feel, does it fill your soul? Does it inspire you? Would envisioning yourself working on that or, or doing that job or whatever, will that make you stop hitting snooze on your alarm every morning? If the answer is no, maybe that's not it. Thank you. Uh, we're getting close to the end. A couple more questions, please do submit it. Brian, here's one. It's a uh, currently a junior studying mechanical engineering, I thought what you said about the importance of motivating, inspiring people to be in charge of their own change when teaching others was very interesting and applicable to the world we live in. Would you be able to speak to how one can do this effectively in teaching or leading? Yeah, of course, I'll try. And actually, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is totally not, not related, but Maya, I'd love to hear where you're from. 
I have someone in my husband's family who did a study on Proudies and apparently we're all related. So I thought that was just kind of funny. <laughs> There's a book, by the way, on Amazon. You can go get it. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I often get at, I liked how you asked your question because I often get asked, how do you motivate people? I don't believe that any one person can in, can motivate any one other person. I believe you can inspire other people, but they have to motivate themselves. And so what I find is I, I really try to get to the heart. Like what's that passion? What's that feeling? What's that emotional piece that you can connect those students or those people to some bigger vision? What is that common collective value that everybody can stand up and go, yes, that's me. Um, that's been the closest thing that I can tell you I, I will offer. Um, if you have not heard of him, I would go look up Simon Sinek. He has a great video and book called Start With Why. Um, and he describes it much better than I can ever even ever even pretend to, but I would I would start there. I see. And I don't want to quit, by the way. I'll keep going forever, but Jeff's going to yeah. make me quit. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy to stay on. Um, uh, another that's come in is what are the plans for the ISS after it reaches the end of its plan life? Plan life, future space stations, question mark. Um, great question. So when I first started space station, we were only supposed to be in existence for 10 years. Now we're at 22. Um, you know, it was, we were supposed to be done at 2010, then we were done at 2015, then we were done at 2020. Now we're up to 2025. Um, we have done analysis on the vehicle itself to go all the way to 2030, but we're not approved or uh, by Congress to go um, to 2030 yet. We're still at 2025. And the plan is we are going to, for the space station as it is today, there's a separate plan that we might have another module on that's going to break off and go be its own space station, but that's still in work. But the current space station as its assembly is today is to deorbit, controlled deorbit um, out, of, out of where it is into the ocean just west of Australia. So it will most, well, I won't say most, there are going to be some big chunks coming down because it's pretty massive, but it, most of it will fall, all of it's going to fall into the ocean, but, and too deep for us to see. So my, my big question is, where am I going to be? Am I going to be in the control center or am I going to be on a boat? <laughs> I'll have to figure that out. Some of our questions that we didn't get to, we have captured in chat and we will try to return that if we have your information, just to let you know. So please don't um, don't uh, feel shy about uh, your, your questions. Ryan, thanks for spending a few extra moments. I guess I would turn it back over to the deans. If there's any final uh, comments or questions you'd like to ask Ryan, uh, I, would, I would start there. Rosie, could we start with you? Sure, this, this isn't so much a, a question, but you know, I was just so struck by, um, you know, along with all of your areas of expertise, for me as a school of, of leadership studies, to think about all of the different skills that are engaged um, in being able to get to that position um, and how you work with teams and your creativity and adaptation and flexibility, like you really um, hit on all of those leadership skills. But I thought the other thing that was just so um, powerful was you are an amazing storyteller. Um, and we <laughs> actually you. teach storytelling as a leadership skill. And so it, it was just, um, I don't know, just sort of inspiring to see you as a engineer, a scientist, um, a woman leader in STEM to also be a storyteller for us tonight. And so I just wanna say thank you for that. It was just very inspiring. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dean Hu, back to you. I'd like to thank you very much for spending the time with us. I know some of our students and C's and faculty are on the, are in the panels, have joined us. And uh, it's just so inspirational for you to tell uh, everyone that engineers can be funny. Um, they don't panic. <laughs> um, they rise to the occasion. 
and that you know, solving problems, big problems, uh, is really what we do. And I hope you've inspired some in the audience to join the profession and live up to some of the things that we hopefully have prepared them to do. And yes, to also keep in mind our Jesuit values, which I think helps to broaden them and help them to maintain good, strong professional, professional ethics while they're at it. Um, and yes, your storytelling is powerful. And uh, uh, I hope our students walk and, and faculty walk away with something that is so very special tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Dean Tanya, would you like to make a few remarks? Um, I will be brief because I, I echo um, the other deans, but um, I guess the two things that strike me is, are um, when you talked about teams having to work together um, and the different skills, and you know, I'm thinking about arts and sciences, the artists, um, the writers, um, the scientists, um, the performers and the public speakers, all of those skills um, are needed in these large teams carrying out these complex um, projects that can advance the well-being of so many people. So um, just hearing, you know, there's a place for everybody in, in these big grand plans. Um, and, and then the other piece is that being open to finding what your place is in, in that and being open mm -hmm. to serendipity. And I, um, your, you sharing your story, I think was very powerful because sometimes we just see somebody's title, we see them in a role and we're like, wow. And then we make a lot of assumptions about how they got there and that they had it all planned out since they were six years old. Um, yeah. And so to hear about your, um, your journey, I think is, is inspiring, even for those of us who are, you know, it's been a while since we've been a student, but we're still a student of life. So I really appreciate that. And I, um, just looking at the chat comments, you have a lot of grateful participants sharing those sentiments. Thank you. Yeah, I always, it's always a gamble when I'm in front of teachers or professors to tell the story that I literally had no plan, but I think it's important for kids to hear. It's okay. It's okay. Indiaro, you want to wrap us up and then I'll say a few final remarks. Sure. Well, let me begin by saying, uh, Ryan, that you you make me grateful to have the job that I have, and um, you make me not want to hit the snooze button at all. I mean, how how awesome it is to be able to to do this with you tonight. So thank you for that, and thank you for all of the dots that you put out there for us to connect. Uh, you are an example of uh, uh, an empowered, strong second grader, <laughs> now <laughs> an amazing woman who has been limitless. And the things that you talked about, um, I think were very striking to, you know, for a lot of us. And one of the most powerful things I think that you put out there um, was the spirit of and the intentionality around the goodness in the international collaboration. Bringing people together from different worlds with different stories to tell, different perspectives, and the kinds of things that were able to be created as a result of that. You know, um, someone in the chat had asked, and Dean Hu had put this out there, how do we reach students from diverse backgrounds? How can we be represented in different ways? How can different voices and different thoughts be there? And I think that that's one of the most important dots um, that we need to pay attention to. And you, you talked about that in many different ways. So I just wanna thank you for that and really lift that up for all of us to hear and focus on uh, that type of intentionality and purpose in really recognizing that our strength is in diversity. When mm -hmm. we come together and we recognize that, my goodness, the things that we can create and the things that we can do, thank you for being an example of that for all of us. Uh, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. I'm I am so glad that came through because I be, I believe that with my whole heart. Well, thank you. We really appreciate it. First, to Ryan for your journey that you took us on, um, 
you know, Ryan and I had a high school called the Kelly Walsh Trojan. So it started in the Trojans and went through the Pokes, and now you're a Zag. You're an honorary Zag at this point. So appreciate Yay! <laughs> yes. Um, I've already, my phone's been blown up, of course, and I've already had several requests to ensure you get to campus next year. So yay, totally bring in and maybe we can do this again because I know it's, we all miss the human interaction. I would also like to thank Deans. Thank all of you so much for your time and your collaboration. To, uh, we don't often get to do interdisciplinary events like this and to be able to bring in leadership and liberal arts and engineering and education and kind of form them and make them into one. This was really gratifying and rewarding. And I hope that our students and alums who attended enjoyed this. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Whitney Franklin and Lucas Schwinn for helping put this together and manage it. Um, we appreciate the quick thinking on our tech issues. Um, and, <laughs> yes, and thank you, this, Whitney. <laughs> getting this done. But this was a really rewarding night and I really appreciate it. This is kind of what this is all about, you know, here at Gonzaga and Ryan, you're now a family member and we truly appreciate it. So we look forward to as one of our Jesuits used to say, to be continued, Father Tony, we'll do this again. Awesome.